What happens in the sky affects life down here on Earth. The celestial compass shows you how and guides your way with astrology you can use from professional astrologer Kathy Beal. Every episode features her light-hearted practical forecasts and navigational tips, blended with humor, optimism, and a love of patterns, symbolism, and pop culture references. Kathy translates technicalities into concepts that apply to real life. You'll learn how the current moment ties to where we've been, from the recent past to cycles that last happened years ago, and get a look at where we're heading. And much more, from special topics to special guests. The Celestial Compass, enlightening, entertaining, and empowering. Here's your host, Kathy Beal. Greetings, Earthlings. This is Kathy Beal of EmpowermentUnlimited.net, and today we are going to talk about what will seem like a strange topic, but it's very dear to my heart and extraordinarily personal to me, um, balancing the professions of law and astrology. I suspect this will be more interesting than you think. But first, let me do an update of the forecast. We're still in the thick of lots of retrogrades. All the outer planets are retrograde. Mercury is retrograde until early October. And then next month, it starts loosening up. But for right now, it's still a time of tripping on things, going back over old business, learning uh, things that maybe we didn't understand before, lots of revelations, getting very or having opportunities to go much, much deeper into all kinds of situations, particularly strong next week when um, Venus and then Mercury both make contacts with Pluto and facilitate extremely important realizations, revelations, uh, and candid conversations. Before then, we have the equinox on the 22nd when the sun moves into Libra, starting the spring in the north, spring in the southern hemisphere, fall in the northern hemisphere, and um, soon after that, on the 25th, we have the Libra new moon. Libra is relationship central, and this one has a lot of energy behind it because Jupiter, the guy that says please give me more, is pumping up the moon. And um, right afterwards, uh, Venus, which rules the moon, moves into Libra, and we all at least start paying lip service to the notion of getting along together. Whether we actually manage to pull that off uh, is another question, but at least there's a, the pretense of being more civil to each other coming by the end of the month. And Libra is also the sign of law, which then leads right into our conversation today. Um, my guest is a fellow attorney astrologer, Sarah R. Diamond. She's a student of astrology and other occult subjects, a practicing astrologer, and a writer. She writes new and full moon essays for the online Daykeeper Journal, book reviews for FacingNorth.net website, and for astrological publications. And for her day job, she still works as an attorney. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, she was a political sociologist and an investigative journalist and published four books about right-wing political movements in the United States. Welcome, Sarah. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah, I'm, and I, I really look forward to discussing this with you because I don't have the background in investigative journalism that you do, but I also have a background in journalism, so there are some strange commonalities in our path, although the timings were different in our lives. Um, it, it, we were talking earlier, and I, I was mentioning, I, I have been aware since the mid-'80s of maybe a half dozen astrologers who are also attorneys. I know of two who practice magical elections, which is mm -hmm. really traditional, and very rule-oriented. I've known two who are litigators, and you're the only person that I've run into who also has an office practice like I do, which means uh, we help people without actually filing lawsuits and going to court. Um, you have been a spiritual quester for most of your life. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us some about that? 
Okay. Um, well, I would say that that has pretty much been my, my life focus. Um, I was raised in um, a pretty religious home with a Jewish religion, which gave me a kind of container for my what I call my innate spirituality. And then um, 50 years ago, when I was 14, I started studying and practicing yoga and meditation, and which is amazing to me that I started so young. Um, I was very fortunate. And then that uh, shifted when I was 18. I got involved with Sufism, and that was my primary practice for a long time. And then I was actually off the, quote, off the path for actually 10 years while I was completely focused on political work. Um, went back to the Sufis in the early 90s and then later shifted to Buddhism. It's, every one of these chapters is a long story in itself. Um, I was all along the way a client of astrologers, actually. So I, I knew mm. a little bit about astrology, but about eight years ago is when I started ardently studying astrology, and that was about the same time that my spiritual practice kind of shifted to shamanism. And then more recently, I'm, I'm studying witchcraft. So I'm, I, you know, I'm very eclectic, I guess you could say. I've got the moon in Sagittarius. Uh huh. Uh, Big surprise. Other, <laughs> other signatures, <laughs> and I, you know, I kind of, it's kind of all of the above. I I haven't rejected any of my previous paths. It's more like a matter of integration. That makes sense. Um, and so we'll come back to this in a second. But as I as I mentioned in your in your brief intro, you've pursued a couple of logic driven careers. It mm -hmm. seemed to me. Can you tell us some about the investigative journalism? Right. Well, you know, every one thing has always led to another. So kind of like out of the the fact that I was practicing Sufism with a, a teacher whose sister had been murdered during the Holocaust. And I also have that in kind of my own background, having been born in Germany. I was the first Jew born in a particular part of Germany after World War II. And then also majoring in Spanish in college, I became very active in Latin American politics, especially Central America, in the late 70s, early 80s. And I had also been, been watching Christian right television, kind of like as a pastime. So by the early 80s, these things converged, and I became a journalist largely by writing about the U.S. Christian right in Central America. And that project completely snowballed, and then I ended up going to graduate school in sociology at UC Berkeley in the mid-'80s. So I was a journalist and a sociologist. So I have Venus and Gemini in the 10th house. Oh, okay. So, so I've that, got, like, a lot of balls juggling in the air, like, all the time, which makes me happy. So I became a journalist really out of my political activism, but then I became a scholar in order to actually ground the journalism. So while I was in graduate school, I was also a journalist. And then I and ended up writing books about the subject. Right. Can you tell us some about the books? Well, the first one came out in 1989. I was, you know, I was like this voice in the wilderness, like kind of trying to warn people about the rise of the Christian right. And this was a, like about a 15, it was a 15-year project that I, I was doing, and it was utterly futile in my view. Because people, you know, outside of Republican circles were not really open to hearing about it. So my first book, uh, Spiritual Warfare, The Politics of the Christian Right, was published in 1989 and, like, received no major book reviews in the United States. Okay? Uh, I mean, it's still out there. I still get letters and, you know, emails from people about it. Um, the second book really was based on my dissertation, for, um, for grad school, and that is a 50-year history of right-wing political movements from 1945 to 1995. So that was, that's like an exhaustive study. And then I wrote two books after that and, and was in the process of wanting to write a book about longtime spiritual practitioners when my personal life kind of crashed with the you know, end of my long-term relationship. And I was, I was at that point teaching sociology part-time here in California, and I was writing. I was not able to make a living. So what did I do? I went to law school at 42. And that's how I became a lawyer, because I needed to make a living. Which is exactly why I studied law. I didn't 
intent. I, like you, I was not someone who went through high school like, I'm going to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And then college, like, I'm going to be a lawyer. It's like, nope, nope, need to find a way to support myself. Oh, boy, I have a brain. Let's do this. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did it later than you. I did, but it was like, I'm good at school. I know I can do school. And actually, you know, in the midst of grief over all of that was going on, having to spend 60 hours a week, you know, in law, the first year of law school was, was kind of like a good thing, you know, like gave me a focus. So once I got, but I, but when I got out of law school, I was 45 years old, so I wasn't really going to be an employee in a law firm, and so I started my own estate planning practice, and that's what I've done for the last 18 years. And for so for those those of you listening at home, estate planning is wills and trusts. So helping people plan what what will happen with their property after they pass on. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually do a lot of that, and I was speaking this weekend with an attorney who is a medium who also has an estate planning practice, and she says that she practices dead law. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't actually say that to clients. I have I have a hard enough time with the fact that a lot of people will say to me, "Oh, I'm doing this in case something happens to me," or you know, I I need a I need a will just in case I die. And I you know I don't argue with people about that, but it, I do kind of like think, really? I mean, <laughs> maybe you think that it's not going to happen to you. You know, there's a lot of den it's a subject that brings up a lot of denial. Let's put it that way. Very true. Mm -hmm. I. I did a lot of that as well. I have uh, my ruling planets in the eighth house, which mm -hmm. is this the house of mortality, everybody, yep. uh, and inheritances. So, uh, and I also did a lot of powers of attorney and um, stuff for people with AIDS. So, right, well, and I have a lot Mars of people in Aries in the eighth house. Ah, yeah, okay. So you do it too. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Makes complete sense. <laughs> complete sense. So. Um, so at this point, you're now. I years ago shifted my focus so that law moved more and more and more into the background. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've I've been practicing a lot longer than you have, and there have been different times when I have attempted to shut it down completely. And after a while, circumstances have said, "No, you don't." But <laughs> uh, I do much, much less of it. I've hit the point where I call myself a recovering attorney. Um, Although I have a few clients with abandonment issues that that I can't get out of completely. Right. But some time ago, several years ago, it switched much more to like 98% of my time is astrology and just a teeny bit um, is law. Now for you, you call yourself a weekend astrologer? Yeah, I have, I have, I envy you. I mean, my, my game plan is I've been studying astrology for eight years and I, I practice on the weekends and I write. And I'm, you know, in a four-year certification program in year four. And my, I, my concept is that as I am eventually able to reduce my hours working as a lawyer, I will be filling all that time with working as an astrologer. So eventually the balance will shift. I hope to get to a 98% uh, astrologer point um, or more, 100%. But, you know, it all depends on the economy and kind of like when I can when I can wind down the uh, work as a lawyer. I would do it this afternoon if I could, um, but that's not possible. Uh, I, am, I am curious. Um, when I was really active as an attorney, when I was still practicing uh, in Texas, there was, a, there was a definite difference in who knew what I was. My metaphysical mm -hmm. clients all knew I was an attorney. Very few of my law clients also knew that I did this other stuff because mm -hmm. A, it was Texas, and yeah. B, um, and it was a few decades ago when it, it wasn't quite the norm. It's become very much... Uh, you know, now you're running into it with United Airlines posting where to go on holiday based on your sun sign. I mean, like, really? It's become that mainstream. Yeah, it's become uh, more popularized. Yeah. 
No, I know where but, you're going with this question. You know, like, yeah. So yeah. I, I, but now, uh, now I'm just now with the internet. You know, anybody who just puts my name in a search engine, they're going to pop up. You know, again, ninety eight percent is going to be about the astrology, and and mm-hmm. I've had some clients that have I've kind of looked at them like, do you not know how to research? <laughs> do you not know what I really do? This is fine with me, but kind of strange. So, do you maintain that kind of wall, or does everybody know everything about you? Um, that's an interesting question. When I first, you know, started like my astrology website and kind of started going out there as an astrologer, I de- it definitely was an issue. My law office website, if people really scroll into it, which virtually no one does, it does have a little bio about me. And, and at the end of it, it does say something like um, that I'm a spiritual practitioner and an astrologer. And virtually nobody has commented on that. I think one person has mentioned that. So I don't think people, it's not hidden. It's right on the website, but it's not blaring. And, you know, I don't deny it. But when I talk to my law office clients, um, I virtually don't hardly ever, I almost never bring it up. I will indicate that, that I have other work I do on weekends, which is why I won't be replying to their law office emails. On weekends, um, you know, I and with that, I say I'm, I'm going a to take a... I, I, I uh-huh. do tell a few people, but I'm very judicious about it um, because I'm not. Oh, I, I don't tell law office clients very much about myself personally in general. Very so smart. It's just one of the things I learned very early on. It's a, definitely a delicate balancing act because you know a lot of people, especially being a woman attorney, they want me to become their girlfriend, kind of, you know palsy walsy and i learned early on that that's really not a good idea because um people will kind of try to take advantage of that so and with that i'm going to take a break right okay. here everyone right. hang out we'll be back the cutting edge of conscious radio ohm times radio iom fm Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single OM Times endeavor. Host your show with OM Times Radio Network. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for Inspired Conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired Conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Want help with your own celestial compass? Visit my site, empowermentunlimited.net, for Astro Insight forecasts for each week, month, and new and full moon. Want to explore the personal impact? Make a decision? Understand another person? (laughs) It is possible. Click the services tab to book a personal session with me. That address again, empowermentunlimited.net. You came across someone struggling with hunger. How would you recognize them? Would you notice an eight-year-old girl who's not not excited excited for for summer summer break because she may not be having lunch again until September? Or a war veteran who's having having a hard hard time time landing landing a job and getting back on his feet? I am the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. I I am hunger hunger in in America. America. Hunger can be hard to recognize. Learn why at IamHungerInAmerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Celestial Compass. I'm talking today about the uh, unusual balancing act between law and astrology with Sarah Diamond. And during the break, I got a text from my medium attorney friend clarifying that she says she practices dead people law. So, okay. Uh, I, we were... see, my clients aren't dead yet. My, mine are still alive. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, anyway, um, so we were we were right before the break talking about um, boundaries and mm-hmm. who knows what um, as to what we do. Um, can you so? With the actual astrological work that you're doing, that you do on the weekends, it's mm-hmm. it's a lot of writing and forecasting. Can you can you talk about what it is you do? Well, it's evolving. Um, I'm I'm in year four of Astrology University's four year certification program, so I'm like really intensely a student, and I'm going to plan on once that's over. I'm, I have another my eye on another program to start studying in. So, student, 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 always. Uh, I'd say about maybe four years ago, I started offering readings. I do them by request. I don't have the the time to really kind of, unfortunately, I don't have the time to really get out there, kind of like market my business as an astrologer. So I rely on people who read my daykeeper journal articles, sometimes contact me. I'm doing, you know, sometimes I do one a week, sometimes it's one a month. It really varies as far as readings go. And I've, I've got a nice little group of people that I've now read for. So I'm doing readings on request, I'm doing the writing, uh, book reviewing, and then um, I'm spending about mm, 10 hours a week studying astrology. So that, that does take up most of the weekend and a little bit on the weekdays. But as I, I eventually I'll evolve into hopefully like less of the student, more of the consultant. And then eventually I hope that my writing book reviews will evolve into my writing actual articles for astrological magazines or general interest magazines once I have more of my own material to write about. So <clears throat> that's kind of my game plan. You had a, an interesting way of, of describing writing astrological forecasting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was joking that I, I kind of consider myself an astrological journalist. Um, because I'm kind of like doing reporting and analysis, you know, which is what I used to do with politics. I would do like reporting and analysis blended together. I was never, I was never like a, you know, like a daily journalist who's just doing, you know, this is what just happened yesterday kind of stuff. I was always an analytical journalist, you see. So with astrology, like with my, my new moon and full moon essays, I'm writing, I, I try to make them kind of, like, they do come out kind of lyrical, they're kind of my way of being creative in a nonfiction writing piece. So I am reporting the transits and the retrogrades, but I'm also kind of giving my gloss and my, my you know, hopefully my metaphorical perspective on, on these things. So that's the kind of writing I'm doing. And then with the book reviews, of course, it's very analytical. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not saying this is a great book. I'm, I'm like delving into what, is, what are the author's arguments, you see. So... Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm employing all of my, my skills that I've had from my previous careers. Very Sagittarian, pulling mm-hmm. it all together. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious, I actually see a, a lot of these. Um, what commonalities do you see between practicing law and being an astrologer? Anything? Um, well, I think there's a sort of sy- systemic um, approach Perhaps I mean I'm not sure that the analogies for in the kind of law I do, um, I, I I'm not sure how much I can make comparisons. I, I make more comparisons between what I'm doing now and my work as a sociologist and journalist. Okay. That well, then. that seems more um, consistent. I mean the lawyer uh, work was kind of like a detour I needed to take. The commonality though is like I've I've done like thousands of law office consultations and so in terms of like talking to people often about really personal heavy stuff like death divorce money children gone awry all of those kinds of topics i can definitely talk to people about that in an astrological context in fact i prefer it because one of the issues i face in the estate planning world is that a lot of people come to me and they act as if i'm a therapist okay this happens all the time. And I'm not a therapist. I'm not trained as a therapist. I'm not being paid to be a therapist. I think it's unethical for a lawyer to behave as a therapist. So people project that onto me. And, I, you know, it's definitely a problem I, have, I face in my lawyer job. But when it comes to astrology, you see, as I get more into it, I'm, a, I'm more comfortable talking about those kinds of issues and emotional responses in a in a an astrological cons, consult that makes uh, more sense to me 
Now, I have the, I have two things that this, this this brings up for me. The first is I recall specifically my first client who was going through a gay breakup before mm -hmm. there were divorces, and I could tell that there was a terrific amount of baggage, and I mm -hmm. foresaw the phone calls. So I actually said to him at the outset, you are welcome to pay me my hourly fee mm -hmm. to vent, or you can hire a therapist. And he never ever once after that brought up what his ex lover had done to him. It mm -hmm. was a brilliant, that was one of my rare brilliant moves to shut a client up at the outset. Um, but the other is, I, I honestly agree that client counseling is one thing that is um, real common between the two because there's a need to figure out where your client is and to actually listen to mm -hmm. what they are asking you. And those are skills, I think, that do carry, that, that splash over for the two professions, very much so. Yeah, they do, they do, although I also am kind of looking forward to eventually taking um, ESAR's consultation skills training, because I feel like, like a lot of what I do in the legal uh, work um, is not going to be serving me that well, because with the legal, where I'm interviewing, it's like, What's, how do you want your name spelled? Who's your trustee? Who are your beneficiary? You know, it's like, okay, it's like really cut and dried stuff. I keep it that way. But when I'm going to talk to somebody about a Pluto transit and, a, and an astrological consultation, I'm not going to be like all cut and dried and, you know, just business, okay? So I'm actually looking forward to making a shift in how I do consulting into more of, in, into more of a therapeutic mode. I agree that it, there is a very strong therapeutic element to it, and people, mm -hmm. they want some level of hand-holding, and essentially they just want to be given some optimism or hope, or please show me where the light is, or please show me that there is a tunnel with a light at the end of it. Yes, Right, where, so, so I keep the boundaries <clears throat> much firmer with the law office clients, because the first year I was doing estate planning, and I, I was all, you know, I'm sun and mercury and cancer, okay? So, like, oh, you know, and everybody wants to, you know, I, I, people often relate to me as a motherly type of person, unconsciously. And, I, you know, I just cannot do that in a legal context, I, you know, for a whole bunch of different reasons. I, I would just be completely burned out by it. I would have people, which I had the first year, you know, sort of throwing crying tantrums at me, you see, once they've done the transference that I'm sort of part of their family. And I even have, have had some law clients refer to me as, quote, a member of their family. Oh, which dear. Which is like, oh, no, 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 actually, I'm not. You see. So, so anyway, so I, I'm firm in the, much firmer in the boundary uh, realm with the law, law practice than I eventually want to be as an astrologer. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be kind of dicey when I'm doing both, you know, the shifting of roles and, you know, I, I think it's doable, but um, I think it's definitely challenging. I'm wondering if you, if you see any skills from lawyering carrying over into astrology. I have a couple that I see, but I will wait to hear if you have well, any thoughts on that. Well, I think it's a, the analytical mind and, you know, kind of the organized mind. Um, you know, like Mercury's my chart ruler. I mean, Virgo rising and, you know, Venus and Gemini. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm very mercurial. So, yeah, the, there's, there's kind of that, but I, I'm not, I don't know. I haven't really, I haven't thought through I think more about myself as a sociologist and journalist and now astrologer. And I mm -hmm. think of my, my job as a lawyer as a detour I needed to take in mm -hmm. order to make a living. I have never related to it as an identity. I, don't, I, I barely relate to it as a profession. I really view it as a job. I really do. I view it as a job that I needed to begin doing and that I continue to do. I consider it right livelihood um, for the most part. But I don't, I, I, for example, I never say I'm a lawyer. It's just, those words do not come off out of me. I say I work as an attorney. That's fascinating. And I've just never been able to bring myself to say, I, I, don't, I can't, I just, it's not something I identify with. And because, you know, because by the time I went to law school, I was in my 40s. Mm -hmm. I, I had a pretty, pretty good identity with, with all kinds of other things, you see. So, um, so I, I guess I haven't really thought of of the of like lawyering as a a thing that I internalize fair enough I've certainly fought against it 
much of my life as well, so I, I get that. Um, one commonality I see is research, trying to mm -hmm. find answers, trying to find answers. In, and actually, a lot of people think, well, some people don't, I think, know or appreciate the level of technical training that mm -hmm. goes into astrology. Yeah. And uh, it's not that we're just, you know, well, because there are a lot of people now who call themselves intuitive <laughs> astrologers. Oh, how nice. <laughs> right. I'll just wake up and intuit what's going on with the planet. No, 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 no. I have years of training of what this means. Uh, sorry, that's a little judgmental, but, you know, Sorry. Well, I would say the scholarship, you know, scholarship has been a thread for my whole life. I was always good at school. I, you know, if mm -hmm. I'm not studying or in some kind of an educational program, I'm not going to be very happy. So, yeah, research, scholarship, looking things up, you know, putting two and two together, you know, all of those things have carried through my, my different careers. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you've got to be detail-oriented. If you're a lawyer, you have to be really detail-oriented and you must get things right. It's not optional. You could really mess somebody up if you, you know, I have a thing going today where somebody wants to insert two words into a trust that could jeopardize their son's getting government benefits in the future. Okay? Two words that I didn't put in there, but she wants to put them in there. So I've, I've had to write a, a note saying that, you know, I, if, you put, if we put these two words into this document, then uh, an SSI eligibility worker might have a problem with that in the future. So I advise you not to do it. You see, so it's get, it can get really granular as to what you have to be accurate about. And one of the things I love about astrologers is they can get really granular, okay, about accuracy, about precision with aspects and timing techniques. And so in that, in the, that respect, I definitely see a parallel. I've, uh, a terrific one, and trying to get an answer to explain something. Um, my particular, in, in recent years, I've had a, a compulsion. Something will happen in the news, and I'll go, oh, I must understand <laughs> this, and I'll just be casting charts. And, and, and pretty much always you can see what's going on. I see terrific and fascinating uh, symbolism and, and parallelism between astrological symbolism and actual current events. And in I know, fact, I've in, read some of your pieces that you post <laughs> and, and listened to a few of your YouTube um, things. Oh, and, thank you. Yeah, yes, it's really good stuff. That's astrological journalism now, isn't it? Well, I suppose that's one way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Oh, I was actually, I was obsessed a couple of weeks ago. I was a huge Better Call Saul fan. Watched every single episode. There are only two shows about lawyers, of which I have watched every single episode. Better Call Saul and The Good Fight. It says a lot about me, I'm sure. And so at the very end of Better Call Saul, uh, I it when it was over, it kept hitting in my mind that the pivotal plot point at the very end of the story happened on the character's 50th birthday. And mm. something kept saying, this is important. So I actually found <laughs> birth data because this show was so detailed. I found birth data for the main character. And sure enough, his the Chiron for that birthday, Chiron mm -hmm. return happens in your 50th, around mm -hmm. your 50th birthday, for those who are listening. Um, it completely explained emotional driver behind his story and then the chart also fit his personality down to every single placement every plot point every placement that i found a chart i found the birth date for his girlfriend fit her their relationship mm -hmm. uh his uh Chiron is on the U.S. moon, which explained to me why this show was so wildly popular. Bottom line is I spent three days, like <laughs> seven to ten hour days, writing this massive essay. And it's up on Medium if anybody is curious okay. about it. But that's an example of it. Like there's an explanation for this uh -huh. and I will find it. And sure enough, there it was. Yeah, it's a brief. Right. Essentially. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I did write briefs. I did write briefs <laughs> well so. okay so it may be there's also an element of like dedication to work and not that other professions don't have that i mean don't get me wrong but there is a bit a bit of obsessiveness among astrologers don't you think 
Yes, I do, actually. And then they want to argue about things, and that's yeah. very much what happens in a law review office. Like, oh, right. God. Yeah, I remember they're similar. <laughs> I, I walked in one day, this will, this will say when I went to law school, and people were actually arguing about whether the ending of... Um, Mr. Goodbar, whether the main, whether the Diane Keaton's character was murdered or not, and people were actually making arguments for how she lived through that, and I went, oh, the, 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 I have more to do in life than this. I'm going to walk out of here. <laughs> we're not going to be part of this. But lawyers will split any detail, <laughs> like his hair. I'm going to split it. Well, guess what? Um, astrologers do it too. You post something online uh, that has any data with it, and someone is going to take issue with the time you used. Oh yeah, used they'll or, take you apart. Yeah. Or what kind of? Oh, I use this house system. Why don't you try this? Like, mm -hmm. really? Right. <laughs> Why don't you put everything? Reptiles and the reptiles and all the other different. I things. like that one. Yeah. So there are all these really arcane methods, and honestly, my experience has been. Completely different methods, if they're valid, will get to the same information, ultimately. And, and that goes for systems as well. You know, mm -hmm. if, it's, if the runes are saying it, yes, the astrology is going to say it, and the tarot cards are going to say it, and whatever. It's all kind of lined up, different traditions, different ways. Uh, but uh, there's a pickiness, I guess, that uh, does hold over between the professions that other people might not think are there because I, I think there's a perception of astrologers being a little more loosey-goosey about things. Not my experience. Yeah, well, one, the, the, when, when I have told people that I'm an astrologer, because I have this kind of a little bit of credibil academic credibility, not a little bit, a lot. I mean, it is to my advantage that you know, I, I'm i not going to be seen as some kind of flaky nutcase. I mean, maybe people will think that, but, you know, I have, a, I have two doctorates. I'm, like, super educated and work as an attorney, so when I have told people that among the smartest people that I know and spend time with are astrologers, that they are, the, they are among the people I consider the, the leading, cutting edge among intellectuals, um, and I've said that to people, you know, to people that don't know about astrology. Why are you into it? Because that's where a lot of the really smart people are. You know? And with and that, then, hold yeah. that thought, hold, hold that, that thought. We will come back to that in just a second. Okay, uh, sure. We're going to have a break. And hold on, stick around, people. This is going to get even more interesting. Bringing a more conscious lifestyle to your world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. How would you like navigational tools you can use on your own? Visit my site, empowermentunlimited.net, and click the Shop tab. There you'll find lots of talks and guides explaining the big influences at work now, like Saturn in Aquarius and Uranus in Taurus. You'll also find a variety of guided visualizations for relaxing, clearing your energy, or getting to know planetary archetypes. That address again, empowermentunlimited.net. My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio, and we'll explore these topics and so much more on Destination Unlimited. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If you could find a way to get inside each other's mind. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk, Walk a mile, mile in, in my, my shoes. shoes. We've all felt left out. And for some, that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Walk a mile in my shoes.
Welcome back to Celestial Compass. I am talking with Sarah Diamond, who is a fellow attorney astrologer. And just before the break, you were making the marvelous statement about astrologers being among the most, what, intellectual, intelligent, what wonderful words were you using for us? Cutting Thought leaders? I don't know. Yeah. Cutting edge intellectuals. I love it. Keep going. Well, I had this experience when I went to my, my first NORWAC conference, North uh, West Astrology Conference in 2016, and there were like, I don't know, a couple, several hundred people there. And I'm in this room um, with, you know, people like Robert Hand and Rick Levine, and I, I can't remember, you know, um, Lynn Bell, and, you know, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm like in this room with all these like really brilliant people. This is fantastic. I hadn't I hadn't been in a room with so much high power intellectual energy since I was an academic since grad school. And so I was telling people, you know, when I came back from this event what a thrill this was. You know, to be with all these really super smart, interesting people. And that's still how I feel about astrologers. For the most part, I mean, obviously it's like a bell curve, it's not everybody, but you know, so that's that's my take on who the who the astrological community is. Is that I wouldn't say that they're smarter than everybody in the world, but you know, there's just a, a lot of really high power intellectual energy in the astrological community, and I really, you know, get I, I it really makes me feel great. Terrifically. To Terrifically active minds who are act, who are looking at things and looking at things from different perspectives and trying to explain how the world works, mm -hmm. explain reality, explain people. Um, I agree completely. It is wonderful. And and you were saying before the break that you have two doctorates. They mm -hmm. are in your doctorate sociology. Are in, yeah, sociology and then the legal de law degree. The law degree. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I don't. Uh, so uh, I have also found that a law background gives inexplicable credibility mm -hmm. to anything else that you might do. And, and my weirdest example of that <laughs> happened um, when <laughs> I, I came up with um, guided visualizations. I, I had for a while a business called Metaphysiques that uh, had uh, low-impact aerobics, uh, which is hysterical given the way my body works these days, leading with long guided visualizations. And I taught people how to actually write their own and use them. And I, through my law degree, I got into a hospital teaching occupational therapists and they were getting continuing education units <laughs> for learning how to do this. And my sole credibility was I had a law degree. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, there's something about, well, if you do this, you can't, uh, people don't question you. It's really, it's well, really right. fascinating. Well, that's why my law office website says in my bio, it has, you know, blah, blah. She went to school here, there, the other. She wrote these books, blah, blah, blah. She's a lifelong metaphysical practitioner and an astrologer. Boom. If somebody has a problem with that, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You see, so this is the Bay Area, also. So this is this yeah. is not, you know, uh, it's. Uh, I, I think people would be hard pressed to have have an issue with that. I once in the '90s, I remember being near Haight Ashbury in the Bay Area, and I actually saw painted in the window karmic law offices. <laughs> <laughs> Was that the '90s? That sounds more like the '70s. Uh, it actually was the '90s. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, early 90s. Interesting. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I wasn't in the Bay Area in the 70s. Um, well, uh, so anything uh, any, anything else about compare, contrast, things that are the same, things that are different? Um, I'm not sure. And I, you know, the, the other thought that occurs to me is that it would be interesting to also ask people in certain other professions. I mean, like, for example, medical doctors are also very detail-oriented, and they sure better be. Um, you know, and it's a different mindset because it's scientists. Science is always a lot, you know, it's hypotheses and testing. There is, a, there is an example there. So in social science, what we're doing is we're testing hypotheses, mm -hmm. just like 
regular science, but our variables are different and our methodologies are different, but the same principle applies. You have a hypothesis, you gather data and test it. That's what astrologers do also. Yeah, they say the there's a plot the point here. Yeah, mm-hmm. charts, you know, it's like we think that, you know, if somebody's, how did we even get any of our, our significations about what is a Chiron return? What does that mean? That's all testing of data. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, we've only been testing on Chiron for a few decades, but all you know. The better example is the traditional planets. You know, all of all of the traditional ideas about what what is this and what does it mean has all been about testing hypotheses for millennia. Right. I mean, that's that's yep. what astrology has done. So in that then, respect, it's like it's like social science. And then collecting the data and making rules out of it, which to me is very much like the common law. Yeah, exactly. Well, the common law is also testing hypotheses. What makes sense? What makes fairness? I mean, that's it's a, it's the standard is different because the standard may be more like like not truth per se, but more like equity or fairness or justice, right? That's you know what what creates common law. But it still involves testing a lot of of scenarios and fact patterns to see well you know when what is negligence. Well, it's when somebody doesn't meet the standard of care. That you know, all of those elements of of any kind of a, an action involve and, having a lot of cases to come up with. Okay, now we say that if you do this, you have committed a negligent act. That was arrived at by collecting data and testing hypotheses. So, in that so, respect, is similar. Mm-hmm. So, for people who whose brains are not polluted by legal studying, common law is. <laughs> law that courts have amassed. It's not legislation that a legislative body has passed, but court rulings that have created a, a like a body of this is what these things mean. There's, that's that's the distinction. Um, yeah. And that's like astrology, where we you know we have we have figured out over the years, and you know that when people are going through a Saturn return, these are some of the common experiences they're likely to have. That's a kind of common law of astrology. Yep. I've thought about that way for a long time. Makes sense to me. Um, I'm wondering, are you acquainted with any other attorney astrologers? Um, the only one who comes to mind when you were sort of saying that you've met a few, I'm, I don't know her personally. I think I've met her once is Nina Griffin, mm-hmm. who does traditional electional type astrology. And I can't think of anybody... I think I have met some people who like used to be lawyers and now they're astrologers, but I, I'm, I'm not. Nobody's name is coming to mind right now. Mm-hmm. I don't, so think, I don't it's, think it's that common. I, it, it doesn't seem like a common combination. No, and and again, um, Nina is one of the two uh, magical elections people. I was thinking. Oh, I thought of somebody. I just somebody yeah. just popped. Christopher Warnock, of course. That that would be the other and one. And he actually, yes. I had a, an email exchange with him about a year ago. He is active in both fields. He's he does he does more astrology than law, but he he definitely and not only does he practice law, he's made law in Iowa. He does tenant law, and he's had a bunch of cases that have like changed the law in favor of tenants. So he's he's an excellent example of somebody who bridges these two worlds, and he's he's a litigator too. So yeah, he's uh, a litigator. Yeah, and and does magical elections, which means picking a specific not just day but time of day mm-hmm. for certain actions based on the result that you want. I think for a while he was also making amulets and stuff. I could be well, wrong he gets, about that. He actually got in some trouble. I don't, can't speak for him, but, but because of his, in Iowa, being an astrologer and being an attorney was, has not been that well received in certain quarters. So he's not living in, you know, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so that's been a much different type of experience, but he's very rule oriented, isn't he? Right. Yes. Very yeah. rule oriented. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, a, and, and just so people, some state bars, and I happen to be licensed by two of them, uh, do not find it unethical to, um, mention anything other than law with anything that is mm-hmm. the slightest bit client oriented. So you have to keep them absolutely separate so uh yeah 
I don't know if that's an issue in Iowa well, or not, but it that, certainly I is in Texas. I agree with that, actually, and that's why somebody, a couple of people have asked me, because I'm also a notary public, so when I do all my clients' documents, I look at their driver's license, and I have to write that down in my little notary journal. And a friend of mine at some point said, wow, that could be like a gold mine of birth data. And I said, no, it's not. Mm. And he said, why not? I said, because I don't, I don't do that. I have to write down when their license expires in my notary journal. I do not blend. I am not working as a lawyer and gathering birth data. No way. Nobody's given no. me permission to do that. Nobody's mm-hmm. given me per- nobody who's who I'm signing documents with has given me permission to discuss their date of birth. I don't look at a driver's license and say, "Oh, you were born on June 26." Oh, uh, no, not at all. Not not now. Not ever. Because when they're working with me as a lawyer, they have not consented to engage in another type of conversation, you see, about anything else other than what we're working on. So that's my own rule. I don't, I don't need a bar to tell me that. And that, that makes me think of one other commonality, and I don't see every astrologer uh, uh, finding this, but I certainly do, and that is the notion of client confidentiality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is a commonality. That we're we're drilled in it as lawyers. We do not discuss anything, even the names of who our clients are, with anybody else. Right, without the client's permission. And mm-hmm. if I if I have an example in something that I'm teaching that does involve, uh, that's information that somebody else went through, I will not share a chart without specific information. And if there is a a fact associated with someone's experience. I will not give any kind of identifying information, mm-hmm. uh, so that no one could, no one has any idea who I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's good training, and I, I hope that astrologers in general are abiding by that because you, you know, it might be harmless most of the time, but but every once in a while, it's not going to be harmless, right? And I, one of the commonalities is maybe Kathy, the sort of vigilance that we're kind of steeped in as attorneys, because we're kind of trained to look for, like, like potential pitfalls, you know, like what could go wrong here. And even though it's probably not going to go wrong, we, it's kind of our, it's our job and duty to look at what could go wrong here. And um, that's certainly true with estate planning. You know, you've got, you got to be really careful because you have, you could be messing some, not just somebody's estate planning, but something with their kids later down the line. You could be messing up. So I think that, that astrologers, it would be good for astrologers to also have that kind of hypervigilance. And so with, with estate planning for, planning, for example, the, if there's a mistake, it might be discovered at a point when it can't be corrected, i.e. Mm-hmm. after someone dies. And what that makes me think of, it's not really a parallel, but it makes me think enormous trust issues when you're an astrologer you've got somebody's psyche being Mm -hmm. laid bare in front of you and the things that you say to them can have a really powerful impact so being Mm -hmm. extraordinarily careful about Mm -hmm. the language you use and the things that you're implanting in somebody's brain. This very early on in my life, I had readings with uh, two different astrologers who taught me what to never do with people. Mm -hmm. And one of them made a pronouncement about my chart that a 26-year-old did not want to hear, which was, you should consider it a gift from God if you have any love life. Which, oh. which is a screwy way of describing Venus and Pisces. And the other, somebody else later working off a chart with the wrong time, which she blamed on the store that generated it. This is before everybody had uh, mm-hmm. software. Um, made a specific ev- uh, uh, outcome-oriented pronouncement about something that was going to happen that was very strange and disturbing and, in fact, not possible. Um, And I became acutely aware of the power of what we say and how our words can actually wield enormous impact. That's a little bit of a commonality here, I think. Yeah, it is. And, you know, whereas with lawyers, we can be charged with malpractice and there can be actual consequences for some of that kind of stuff that we screw up. 
and and with astrologers, one of the we could go on and on for hours on this whole thing of you know there's no built-in structure for astrological malpractice. I mean, I'm not going to talk about it right now, but I've had a, one of the reasons why I started astrology, studying astrology eight years ago was because of the the horrendous things that some astrologers had said to me. Ah, okay, so there's another I finally threw my uh-huh. hands up in the air one day and said, okay, I'm going to the bookstore and get a bunch of books. And that's what led me to actually start studying astrology on my own. But there's nobody, there's no, there's no entity that's going to really be able to monitor or do anything about the kinds of things that you're describing. The kind of malpractice that can go on with astrologers. This has been an on-again, off-again topic of discussion in a variety of organizations Mm -hmm. for a long, 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 long time. Well, this has been fascinating. I'm so glad that you came. And see, everybody, there's really a lot to think about here. You thought, what a topic. No, actually, it's there's a lot here. Um, Tell people where they can find you. Well, um, a couple of places. They can go to my astrology website, which is Sarah, S-A-R-A, no H, Sarah Diamond Astrology.com. That's all one word, Sarah Diamond Astrology.com. Um, where else? They can Google around, you know, Sarah. I also have a law website, Sarah Diamond Attorney.com. Both of these sites give people my email address, which is the best way to get a hold of me. And you also have your forecasts at Daykeeper Journal, correct? Daykeeper, daykeeperjournal.com. I'm doing new moon and full moon uh, essays. They're called Lunar Wisdom. Yeah, and they are essays. They're, they're really, um, you really think things through. So thank you so much for being here. Thank I've you, enjoyed Kathy. it. This has been tremendous fun. I really enjoyed it. Okay, bye everybody. See you in a couple of weeks. <laughs>